Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 20 of the Madden America podcast. Before we get started, I just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to listen and also to ask that if you like the podcast, please consider leaving us a review in iTunes as it really helps to get more listeners. Thank you. This week, my guest is Dr. David Healy. Dr. Healy is an internationally respected psychiatrist, psychopharmacologist, scientist and author. A professor of psychiatry in Wales, David studied medicine in Dublin and at Cambridge University. He is a former secretary of the British Association for Psychopharmacology and has authored more than 200 peer-reviewed articles and 20 books including The Antidepressant Era and his latest book Pharmageddon published in 2012. David is a founder and CEO of Database Medicine Limited, which operates through its website risk.org and is dedicated to making medicine safer through online direct patient reporting of drug side effects. David, thank you so much for talking with me today for the Madden America podcast. I wanted to start by asking about your background and what led you to setting up Database Medicine and risk.org. Okay, well, the background is this, I think, that for whatever reason, I've been instinctively inclined to believe people when they come along and tell me that, you know, I was put in this drug and this has been happening to me. And um, one of the things I found then, early on, years and years ago, when I began to say, look, people have been coming in to me and saying to me that when they get put on an SSRI, they become suicidal. When I began to get pushback from the wider world saying, look, the clinical trials don't show this, this got me interested in why this mismatch between what people seem uh, you to be saying to me and why the evidence that's out there seems to point in a different way. And there were two things to it. First of all, the general inclination of a lot of doctors not to believe patients. And this seemed to me to be getting worse. It seemed that Back in the 60s, while there was always doctors thought they were God and things like that, to some extent, they still had an incentive to listen to patients because this is a way they could get their name known. If they were the first to describe this, that, and the other, uh, it was a way to get their name out there too. But that seemed to be getting harder and harder. There seemed to be more pushback generally. And the other thing about it then was I stumbled across the fact that actually When you looked more closely at the clinical trials, two or three things became clear. One is that actually the clinical trials showed an increase in the risk of people becoming suicidal also, but somehow we seem to be able to turn a blind eye to this. And the other thing was that we didn't have access to the data. And when I got access to the data in the course of some legal actions, it became crystal clear that not only was there an increase in the published articles of the risks that people have been telling me about. But actually, when you saw the raw data, there was an even bigger uh, increase in the risk. And the other thing you saw was that actually a lot of the articles claiming there was no increase in risk were ghostwritten. In fact, almost everything seems to be ghostwritten, and there's no access to the data at all. So this brought me to the position a few years ago, five, ten years ago, that really the only solid data I have to go on is what the people who come to me say is happening to them on the pills. And maybe we should try and create a space where people can come and talk about these things. There's a lot of people who go on about the fact that we're over-medicalizing things, that um, generally speaking we shouldn't be using drugs rather than non-drug kind of treatments and things like that. But everyone, everyone actually skirts away from the harms. You know, the, the, when a patient talks about they go on a statin or this, that, and the other drug, and this happens to them, the conversation is, well, you shouldn't be on kind of statins. You should be taking garlic or you should be taking walnuts or whatever. But it's not, well, we believe you, and how do we help you get your doctor to believe you too? That's the bit that seemed to me to be missing, and that's intrigued me the whole way through. Why Why people, for the most part, have got scared of their doctors? Because you know, they seem to figure the doctor's going to get nasty. 
Well, I wanted to thank you, David, because risk.org for me as a consumer allows me to easily understand and investigate adverse effects and potential clashes between medications. And that's information which is very difficult to find via mainstream sources. If I do ask my doctor, they probably don't want to worry me. And the information that comes with the drugs is often impenetrable, particularly for those who may be struggling. So risk.org does an excellent job of allowing the consumer some informed choice around their medications. Well, that's the hope. Uh, And actually, it's a way to find new drugs and a way to reduce healthcare costs as well. Because if we pick things up that are going wrong early on, there's a better chance that you're not going to end up in hospital, that you're not going to consume healthcare uh, resources and things like that. So it should be win-win. But the intriguing thing is that it's there's a lot of people out there who don't see it as win-win. I imagine. Thank you, David. I wanted to move on now to talk about post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. This is a condition which is not widely known about and little understood, and I wondered if you could help me understand a little more about the condition and your work to help those affected. Sure, Uh, but first of all, uh, let me make one quick point here. There is a lot of people who look at risk and say, well, why are they getting involved in this issue? There's a lot of other issues that are just as important, like people become suicidal on a range of drugs, not just the antidepressants. I mean, it can be antibiotics and other drugs too. And there's people getting hooked to a lot of drugs. Uh, and, you know, there's vastly more people hooked to the SSRIs than are having problems like PSSD. So they wonder, to some extent, why we've focused in on this. And the answer <clears throat> really is it's not we're looking at PSSD and not at withdrawal and not at akathisia, but actually because we think this could be a key to unlocking what's happening in a lot of enduring withdrawal syndromes and problems like akathisia also. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? And people would get the wrong message if they think all of a sudden that we've got consumed with the idea of sex, okay? Having said that, one of the intriguing things about the antidepressants, which, which you don't hear about, is that in the case of the of um, the SSRI group of drugs, if I mean I've had an SSRI as part of healthy volunteer work and things like that, and you know, so there's no illness there. But you know, to to actually say, well, look, the illness could be causing what you think has happened to you. But one of the obvious things about the SSRIs, when you take them, just out of the blue, is 30 minutes later, if you check, you're a bit more genitally numb than you were beforehand. And this, this, this seems to happen to virtually everyone who goes on one of these drugs. There's a degree of either genital um, kind of numbness or ger- genital irritability. But there's a change one way or the other. And that's the thing that's, I mean, and, and it occurs in close to 100 um, 100. 100% of the people who go on these drugs. It may just be a very small area of uh, either the tip of the penis or part of the clitoris, or it may be much wider. It may spread to the inside of your thighs and things like this. So that's there, and that can lead on to problems then that people have when they're on these drugs, making love or being able to function and things like that. And the usual response to people has been, well, yes, this is the case, but it clears up once you halt the pills. Now, what's intriguing is that it's probably the case from a very few years after the SSRIs uh, actually came on the market first, that some people reported to their to um, uh, the doctors that have put them on the pills that, well, you know, this hasn't cleared up. I've, I'm, I'm off these pills now for months, and I still seem to have a problem. The response almost for sure will have been, well, that's your illness. People who are uh, depressed lose lose libido and things like that. But but it's not. And uh, it's um, it, it took a long time for it to come out. And it took a very few, well, it, it took a few very brave people to go out there and say, look, this has happened to me, uh, you know, for anyone to begin to pay heed to it. And the other thing that was interesting about the way it came out was that it came out in a set of obscure journals. Uh, The other aspect of this is um, 
quite aside from the SSRIs causing this problem, there's a number of other drugs. There's drugs like like Roaccutane, which is used for acne. It seems to cause exactly the same kind of problem. And then there's a drug called Propecia, which is used for young men who, whose hair has begun to thin. And this is a drug that will reliably cause your hair to thicken up again. But one of the things that began to happen was that people on both Propecia and Roaccutane, which had both come on the market roughly around the same time that the, the SSRI group of drugs did too, also began to, to discover that when they halted these drugs, the problem could endure. Now, oddly enough, one of the extra odd things was that <clears throat> every so often there were people who didn't seem to have much of a problem before they halted the drugs, and it was only when they halted the drugs that uh, 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 the problem began to uh, appear in a very prominent way. It sort of appeared to get worse. And the response a lot of people had when they tried to take it to the, well, to uh, 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 the doctor uh, that they were seeing was, well, look, you know, this can't be caused with a drug. The drug is out of your system. Uh, the, the whole idea of a problem uh, appearing after the drug had left your system just seemed crazy to loads of doctors. But again, this comes back to the point about why don't we believe people? I mean, people aren't going to come along and say these things for fun. Uh, they are, you know, they're pointing to a very real thing happening to them. And their encounter with the healthcare system was, you know, that they felt they were being disbelieved and sometimes ridiculed, which isn't what care is about. That's rubbing salt into the wound, isn't it? For people to experience these distressing effects, but perhaps only later realise those effects may endure long after the medication has been stopped. For that to be discounted and labelled as medically unexplained, that's very difficult for those affected. I can also see now, David, why you say that understanding this might be the key to unlocking the reasons behind withdrawal effects and many other protracted experiences. And, you know, it's um, one of those things, uh, you really wonder where doctors are coming from in that I can still recall the first lady that came to me and said she had this and she made it very graphically vivid that you know she really had a problem that was extraordinary uh, sort of a thing that she didn't ever think could happen and one of the best ways to bring this home to people is that in the case of people with ESSD they can take chili paste and rub it into their genitals and not feel a problem. You know, this has to be real. This is not mental. You know, it's something has happened in this area. And the intriguing thing is, well, it seems to me, is that, you know, it's very clearly tied to what happens within 30 minutes of going on the drugs first. There's a problem the drugs cause within 30 minutes. And I think we can probably explain how this happens. And the extra bit that is why for some people this endures afterwards. We need to crack the issue about just why this thing that happens early on endures for some afterwards. And David, when you wrote your paper in 2014 on this, you identified 120 cases, I think, that you pulled from the risk.org database. And since you've been talking about the issue more and there's been a little more awareness, I just wondered whether you've had an increase in the number of reports of PSSD coming to you via risk.org. Before we put the risk prize in place, we had a paper that we uh, sent off to a journal for review on 300 cases. So we've had much more than we had before. We've also got more than just the 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 300 cases. These were just the ones where we felt absolutely sure that we had all of the details that we needed in order to be able to compare the different issues in terms of age and sex and duration and things like that. But actually, we've got probably closer to 350 or 400 cases overall. These come from 37 different countries. So, you know, this is a global thing. This is not just something odd that's happening in the United States or the United Kingdom. It's happening in India and China and Brazil and everywhere else as well. 
Well, as we mentioned before, I think it just demonstrates the value of risk.org because to capture that information, which otherwise might be going off to individual GP practices and never be collated, I think that's so valuable. And David, you mentioned there the risk prize, and I just wanted to go on to talk about that if that's okay. You started what is a groundbreaking and highly innovative campaign, which aims to help those affected by PSSD. And I wondered if you could tell me about the risk prize and how it works. Yeah, the idea is this. First of all, there's a lot of people out there who are very distressed by what happens to them, and they've got on to commit suicide. So there's people out there we need to give some hope to. There's, they've got on to try all sorts of dangerous treatments and things like that, uh, and they've spent a lot of money going on to therapists who say they know all about sex and things like this, and they can help them, but in fact, they can't. So a lot of money has actually been spent on things that could be risky and aren't helping. And the idea, it seemed to me, would be if we had a risk prize, uh, we could turn things round. We could get people to come to us. It's a case of if we're the people who have the money and saying, look, we have this money that we'll hand over for a treatment that really works, uh, then we put ourselves in the kind of position where other people, once they hear about the prize, and this is researchers of the various different sorts, are just lay people out there who are interested to begin to hunt for these things. And it needn't be a person working within healthcare that's going to come up with the answer. But if, if, we, can, if we can turn things around so people hear about the prize and figure, well, yes, you know, I know a bit about this, uh, and I think I have a treatment option that may actually make a difference and it's going to be safe. We can get them to do the work and come to us rather than us taking the risk. So that was one of the key things behind it. But also, as this began to take shape, it became clear to me that, you know, generally in terms of the harms of pills, if we organize uh, that we can do this not just for PSSD, but for withdrawal problems and a lot of other problems too. If we, if we cooperate, we can put ourselves in the kind of position where there, rather than us waste our money and take risks with things, that we can create the kind of situation where other people do the work for us. It's, there's an old cartoon about the golden rule, which says, he who has the gold rules. And the problem that loads of us who suffer the harms of pills have is that we're very isolated and on our own and at the mercy of the people who have power in healthcare. The idea is to try and take a little bit of the power back and give ourselves a bargaining chip. Well, it's bold and I think unique to utilise the power of crowdfunding in this way. And what's so good about it is having established the prize, work can get underway quickly, can't it? Rather than perhaps the normal pathway of many years of research and trials and peer review, and the medical world can be very slow to react to these things. This is immediate and dynamic and involves the community of those affected. And um, I think one quick point to bring out is I think actually there's been a lot of work in the area. So I'm fairly confident that there are people out there who have the answer to this problem and hopefully the answer to withdrawal and things like that too. It's just they don't know we're having the problems that they have the answers to. So the idea is trying to raise the profile and give them a bit of incentive to begin to think about could the things that they know a lot about be helpful to us. Thank you. And David, how can people get involved in the campaign? One of the key things that people can do is to just spread the word. Uh, if you've got media contacts and can get anyone who's willing to write um, uh, uh, an article about the condition and about what we're doing, just that this is a new kind of approach to getting the answers that people need as opposed to people being told this is the thing you think you need. Um, so if we can get people in the media interested in these things, if we can get the wider public uh, aware that there are issues, that there are risks to treatment that they're not being told about, risks that may be particularly important for the increasing number of 
teenagers who are being put on these pills, this is the kind of thing that, you know, they probably want to know about before they begin treatment. If we can get a wider public generally involved in the whole in, uh, issue and aware that, you know, there may be scope for us to take back the direction of healthcare research, take it back into our own hands, as opposed to just being totally dependent on the powers that be to do the research that's going to make profits for them as opposed to helping us, then these are the kinds of things that will hopefully generate interest and generate a, a, a popular movement. One of the things to stress in all this, and it's not clear, we're going to make it a little bit more clear hopefully soon, is that in terms of uh, at the risk prize, every single cent everybody gives towards it is going to go towards finding a cure. There isn't anything going into overheads. There's no one being paid anything out of it. You know, it's totally concentrated on finding uh, the answer to these issues. Well, it's such a good way to achieve critical mass, isn't it? To gather a group of people who have a similar goal, be they a patient or a clinician or a family member of someone affected, it's such a good piece of work to draw a community together and to put some formality around the process. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, overlap here with uh, the Occupy movement in a way, that it's about occupying healthcare again. And one way to put it is this, that... um, Every drug has 100 um, effects. There's the one effect that companies and doctors want you to hear about, but there's the 99 other effects that may impact on you. And what we're looking at here is is those is the other 99% of effects. But also, you know, when it comes to these issues, it's we who are on the pills who are the who are also the 99%. And I think we need to make sure our voice is being heard and that the system works for us as opposed to just for the few. Absolutely. And David, if people wanted to find out more about the campaign, is there a particular website they should visit? Yes, they should go to risk.org, where right on you, when, you, when you go to uh, at the front page, there's a little box in the upper right corner that points you to the risk prize and if you click on that you'll be able to see all of the things that have been done to date uh, at the organizations that have been contacted where the contributions have come from and some thoughts about what people can do uh, in this area one of the intriguing things for me has always been that uh, uh, that it's people who often know nothing about healthcare who get motivated by the issues who come up with the answers. And that's what I'm hoping people will do with this as well. Having said that, there is a great deal of information out there about exactly how genitals go numb on these pills. So I'm pretty confident that there will be people out there either who research in this area or who read about what's been done, who will be able to put the pieces together and come up with an answer well it's bold innovative and exciting and i wish you every success with it because providing a focal point for the community in this way is so powerful david is there anything else that you'd like to let people know well uh, you know i'm sure there is uh this is an area i could talk about for ages and um one of the interesting things is that when people do get um involved in all this for instance there's all sorts of little things uh the people who uh, who've actually got in touch and they've contributed funds and things like that. And when they've tried to spread the word to other people and persuaded other people to contribute also, they feel hugely empowered, um, which is interesting. And um, aside from all that, then, there's just, just, just the general sense of we can... I mean, when you have an online group, we can offer each other great support but we often turn in, uh, we often begin to talk about things, we complain about things. The fact that we have a thing to do, to organize around, seems to me to be very important. And these, I mean, these are issues that I'm sure a lot of activists and all know vastly more about than I do. Uh, and the things that I'm just 
learning for uh, uh, the first time. And the group that I look to really is the the AIDS group uh, back in the 80s, you know, who had a horrific disorder, who were at the mercy of the healthcare system, who organized and embraced the stigma of the problems they had and did a lot to change healthcare through their efforts and found not quite a cure, but, but, but you know, the next best thing. The hope is that, you know, again, that we can try and get people mobilized in the same way and thinking in uh, at the same way also. Well, it is empowering because you've allowed people like me to contribute to a solution rather than just complaining to my doctors. We're actually part of the answer, and that's emboldening for people who have been damaged by medications. Mm -hmm. I think the big thing with when we've been harmed by pills is nobody wants to know, really. I mean, there's, there's the harm from the pill, and there's also an isolation that goes with it. You know, it, it's you get left behind by the herd. We need to turn things around and we need to find a way to get people who've been harmed to cooperate and to realize often that actually central to, I mean, the harm that I may have may be that I become suicidal, the harm that other people may have may be that they aren't able to function from the sexual point of view or the harm that other people again may have made, they may have muscle aches and pains from a fluoroquinolone, maybe a statin or whatever, but common to all these things is the fact that there's lack of access to the data, there's lack of listening to people when they have problems, and the literature that doctors go by is all ghostwritten. So there are common factors here, which the idea is to try and use the common factors to draw people who have different problems uh, 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 together under the same tent. Well, this work is critical to achieve that. And again, having used the risk.org data firstly to demonstrate the problem, you've then gone a step further in looking for a solution. David, thank you so much for standing up for the community and thank you for taking the time to talk with me for the podcast. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, James. It was an honour to be able to chat with David. And as a reminder, to find out more about the Risk Prize, visit the website risk.org. That's R-X-I-S-K dot org. Please consider supporting the campaign, and if you can't directly contribute, please share the details as widely as you can on your social networks. Thank you. Madden America News and Updates On Madden America Around the Web this week, a new study reported on by the British Psychological Society notes that the placebo effect is amplified when doctors appear likeable. A great deal of clinical research tries its best to find the true effects of a treatment above and beyond the placebo effect. That is, the benefits that can arise purely from a person's expectations that an intervention will be helpful. A new study in health psychology takes a different approach. Instead of always seeing the placebo effect as a nuisance variable with mysterious impact, argue Lauren Howe and her colleagues at Stanford University, we should try to find out more about how to enhance it and how to diminish its harmful twin, the nocebo effect, when negative expectations can lead to harmful effects. To this end, the researchers examined the possible moderating influence of a physician's demeanour, finding that the placebo effect is enhanced by the impression of warmth and competence. Howe and her team write, Among the many demands of a career in medicine, physicians have been increasingly directed to build rapport with their patients, for example by exhibiting empathy. This research suggests a compelling reason for why physicians should pay attention to these psychological and social forces. They can impact physiological health outcomes. For more on this and other blogs, reports, news items and events too, visit maddenamerica.com. So, thank you for listening. Please come back next week for another episode. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.